Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for being here tonight. Like I was saying earlier, um, if you're just joining us, I'm actually in zygote space, as you can see. I'm going to walk around and pan, just kind of pan around a little bit just to give you a sense of the space if you've never been here before. We are open tomorrow. Somehow they can, oh, I got to mute. 12 to 4 p.m. Um, so if everyone could just mute your audio, that would really help. Um, you can kind of get a sense of the space here, but I will actually also be showing some walkthrough footage that is much more attractive during the presentation this evening. So 12 to 4 p.m., you don't need an appointment. It's just a pop in. We only allow 10 people in the gallery at the time. We do require you to wear a mask. Obviously, I'm not wearing one right now because I'm the only person in the building. Um, so um, bring your masks and we will have a Zygote intern to um, help take care of you and guide you. Um, I am gonna share my screen now. I've prepared a PowerPoint for the artist talk this evening. First of all, I wanted to point out that this exhibition that I'm currently sitting in, let's just pretend we're having fun, is the work of two artists who are here with us tonight, Mark Schatz on the right and Kasumi on the left. And here you can see them. This is last year during the depths of the pandemic working at Zygote Studio. Both of them were artists in residence during the pandemic and still came you know, with proper safety procedures. We all were able to work here um, and, and both of them produced the body of work that you can see here in the gallery at Zygote. Um, I'm gonna actually start tonight with uh, with Mark Schatz's work. This is an installation view. Um, this walkthrough is actually on a Zygote's, um, Zygote's YouTube page. So if you wanna get a chance to, to watch it for yourself, this, this is a much better representation of what is going on behind me. Um, but Mark Schatz, he received his BFA in sculpture from the University of Michigan and an MFA in sculpture from the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, his practice includes sculpture, installation, drawings, and photography, and he is currently assistant professor and the foundation's program coordinator for the School of Art at Kent State University. Mark Schatz, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Yeah, a great opportunity. Thanks. Um, and just a reminder, everyone who's with us tonight, if you could please mute your audio until the end of the presentation, it would be really helpful. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so Mark, to start us off, can you talk a little bit about your experience working at Zygo? You are primarily a sculptor and an installation yeah. artist. Um, yeah. Was this the first time you've ever experimented with printmaking? It's not, um, but, it, but I'm still really new. I still have like the training wheels on. So uh, I've played around, I don't know, it's one of those things where sculpture is uh, is not media specific or it's not it's not necessarily media specific. So learning new materials, new processes is pretty normal to my process. Uh, frustrating sometimes because I'm always uh, I'm always grappling with something new. But um, but somehow I made it through undergraduate where I tried to take a little bit of everything without taking printmaking. Um, and then it took me um, far too long to sort of stumble back into it, and um, and the the speed is really different than most of the rest of my sculptural practice, which is really slow and arduous. And I think by printmaking standards, I'm still like uh, painfully slow. Like I wrestle with everything very slowly and watch other people like whip things out. But to me, it's a it's a it's a real acceleration. So that's been fun to play with. Well, could you tell us a little bit about the, the monotypes that you created for this exhibition? And actually, I was wondering, did you make the, the monotypes first or did you make the augmented reality first yeah. and then make the monotypes to reflect the augmented reality or vice versa? Yeah, so the short version of the, of the story of this work that I've been telling everybody is that I've, I've done some monotype things. Um, the were interesting or some prints that I thought were interesting, but I wasn't quite sure what to do with it. Right? It's just a fun thing to learn. Um, and I didn't have quite a place for it. And I've done some 
uh, 3D modeling and, and played around with augmented reality, you know, apps and, uh, and various tools as they've as they've been developed, and they're cool. But I didn't really know what to do with it. But um, uh, but if I took those two halves and, and put them together, uh, it made it a lot a lot more fun. So um, it always started with the print, and that's where the um, uh, you know any type of 3D model thing or augmented reality thing just feel really artificial, uh, can feel really constructed. Uh, so I wanted I wanted that that physicality, something about the tactile gesture. How do I take this gesture and make it uh, come alive? So I always started with um, sort of creating an inventory of shapes that were interesting but simple enough that I could I could pull them in and, uh, and begin to, to figure out how to transform them into models. That's so interesting because my next question was: Is there a significance to this cast of characters, the shapes? that the shapes themselves, I mean, to me, they're like, I don't know, like gestural mid-century balloons. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. That's the vibe. And there's no color um, in the studio, or I mean, in the gallery here. There is some color in the augmented reality world, but could you talk a little yeah. bit about these shapes? Yeah, and there were a few colored prints that, um, that made it into models, into, into a couple of the models, but the, that weren't prints that ended up on the walls. So it was a real sort of play between the two, where I didn't want it to just be completely one-to-one. -one. Um, but uh, yeah, the shapes are, are cool. I like them. Um, I think for me, it was really part of this process in such a frustrating year where all of the plans that I think everybody on the planet had for the year, like it got completely scrambled. So certainly the ideas that I proposed originally for, um, uh, you know, what I would do with the residency, that wasn't gonna work. Um, and uh, all kinds of things shut down and I just had to figure out a way to sort of find, um, find pleasure, be okay with that, just find some movement. So, I wanted to keep it really simple so that I could move it between two processes that were both new to me, but I like them. I've been using the word ins unstable, right? They're, they're basic, but none of, nothing is quite geometric. There's something a little bit, uh, there's a little bit of movement in all of them, a little bit of, a little bit of shifting. Um, well, there definitely is. And then when, so when confronted in the gallery just with the works on paper themselves, that's one experience. But for those of you who have not visited the gallery yet, you may not know that that, that Mark has created augmented reality sculptural works um, that can be viewed as you walk through the gallery by downloading an app to your smartphone. Um, and he has kindly left us instructions and with a little help from a younger person <laughs> or, or if you're savvy yourself. Um, you can experience these amazing creations that if you've ever, I don't know, played Pokemon Go, remember Pokemon Go thing <laughs> for a minute there, um, it's, it's the same technology. Um, so it allows you to physically interact with the work in a way that is, it's, well, it's beyond three dimensions, right? It's almost four. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah. how did you come to expand your practice? I mean, you mentioned 3D modeling. Was that a natural step into augmented reality? Or did you plan on working with augmented reality during the residency? No, I didn't plan on working with it at all. Um, uh, it's just one of those things where sometimes everything you planned on doing has to fall apart in order for you to do something better. <laughs> it's probably more interesting than any of your plans. Um, so, so it came down to these basic elements, and then I was like, I, I need to know, I need to figure out a way to feel excited about these basic elements in a way that has some connection to me, uh, whether or not it has a connection to my practice um, really directly. It, I just didn't want to do what every sort of printmaking 101 student would do, sort of like cranking out, you know, your, your first practice prints as you learn a new process. Um, so, uh, a lot of my previous work has dealt with sort of architectural spaces or, um, or the experience of space. And I think that's the thread 
Um, and some of it has gone down to miniatures, almost like architectural models. And it's not that I like miniatures. Um, I actually really like making big things and little tiny things that are fussy or infuriating, but, um, but they allow me to visualize a bigger space, right? That's what's fun about a model. So that's what was exciting to me about this is it, it let me visualize these things as an installation or to scale them up. Um, and because I was designing them, I got to take these wherever I wanted. They didn't have to live in the gallery for me. Um, that's my like, you know, right. kind of magic key on, on my devices. So I could take these to the park. I could take these uh, downtown. I could, um, I could watch as people walked through or, or as these floated over water. Um, and it really changed them for me. And, and so it's a way of activating spaces or activating the forms in terms of context as they relate to a space and, and take right. on or, or change that, that meaning. But you can definitely see the connection between the, the print works and the, and the um, AR works by just the shapes that you used. And so clearly there's a connection between them, these abstract shapes yeah. and the printed work. Um, but um, can I, I just have to show this one because it's my favorite, this little guy. Definitely my favorite. Don't really know why. I just really felt attracted to it. <laughs> but like you were just saying, um, another great thing that you did was you uh, you took them outside. So it's right. one thing to experience them in the gallery, and it's an entirely um, different experience to see them out in the wild. Can you talk a bit about these open air studies? Um, I know. It's just, I think it's always interesting when any artist's work leaves the studio, you know, because it becomes this, you know, pieces come together in the studio, you, you sort of forge some relationships, but it becomes a very different work. Those relationships have different sort of resonance when you take them into different contexts. Um, and certainly, uh, this I had the ability to not just take it into different contexts, but to play with scale and to actually animate them. So they become these sort of characters in these different contexts uh, without uh, without an explicit narrative. So they could just they could just be these sculptural forms or uh, you know, printed images, but um, but then they're gonna they're gonna move through the space in a way that. Uh, that adds something for a sense of gravity, lack of gravity, or, or material. There, there's my favorite character. Do you, you don't, everything is untitled, right? Except for right. the larger, you know, let's just pretend we're having fun. And I think there's obviously a lot of weight to that title. Um, and it reflects, because one of my questions was, how did working during the pandemic, you know, affect not only your work, but you. And I mean, you've already spoken a little bit to this, yeah. but um, it's almost, there's an element of play going on. There, there is, and I, I think that was a coping mechanism, you know, um, because the year was hard. It's hard to have your plans scrambled. When your plans get scrambled, you tend to reach out to other people, but all of their plans were scrambled too, right? So it's really, I think it was a really isolating year for a lot of people um, and, and it felt isolating for me. And it's not going to be fun, but I think um, something I admire about kids, right? So I had to like tap into something childlike or, or give myself permission to do something childlike is that they can figure out how to have fun even when everything's uh, you know, not going according to their plan, at least, right? So we all know it's like when you're squirming around because they're forced to go to something by their parents. So some kids will like figure out how to find a game. And sometimes that's, you know, frustrating to parents, but, uh, but I needed to give myself permission to just um, uh, find a game, just find the stimulus and, and let it see what it could become. Uh, let it do something absurd in this space. And there isn't there isn't a meaning to it other than, um, you know, just being able to enjoy that, um, enjoy that interaction for a moment. 
totally. at least part of it, right? I don't know. Like I said, it's, that title could be, you know, double-edged. It could, it could be really cynical or it can be um, uh, a, a bit of a surrender to just, let's just try. Right. It, are all of these scenes around Zygo, these outdoor scenes? Yeah, video. so everything that I included in the videos here is, is in the immediate vicinity. Um, I, I, so I, I recognize it. a lot of them. Um, yeah. So seeing seeing the building, you know, surrounded by your creatures is, is there's something really pleasing yeah. about that too. The idea of taking them for a walk, you know, like taking them outside. And I don't know about you, but taking walks in the past year and going outside yeah. talk about a coping mechanism you know being able to do anything outside when it's nice out um always was very meaningful so the fact that you almost created a game in a way you know it's like a game like pokemon go but yeah like, not quite <laughs> right i always i always admired that about or, or, or enjoyed that about pokemon go which i didn't have any real interest in playing but uh but yeah, we had some, especially at the Heights, it was, it was bananas. We, we, yes. I was, I was Everywhere. in New York at, at one of those points and we were in Central Park and you could tell that like almost everyone around us was playing that game. And I don't know if it's just because there were special Pokemon creatures in the area, but it was all adults. So I was just like, this is so strange. Like what a strange reason for everybody to come outside and have this interaction. So I enjoyed it even though I still have no interest in capturing uh, whatever it is. Right. Uh, I thought that was a really interesting idea. And I love the idea of sort of like releasing your, your art objects into the wild like that. Definitely. And as you can see here, um, the repetition of the forms, you know, continue outside. So you can play with them inside, you can look at them on the wall, or you can watch them outside. So you've really given like a multi-level experience of this aesthetic um and it's really fascinating to me but one thing that um struck me just as an observer i find it really striking that you both created you and kasumi both created work pretty much completely opposite in media and in a way in an in intent as well like kasumi instead of creating film although you did create one film um, you were attracted to the tactile quality of the paper and the inks and the and the the qualities of paper and ink. And Mark, you, while you did enjoy the tactile, you said this the working with the presses, but you also retreated into kind of a virtual dream world, a fantasy world. And some of the work involved is completely intangible. You know, it's it's it you can't yeah. touch it. So I just thought witnessing both of you work on these bodies of work through a pandemic and come out with two entirely different experiences is very fascinating to me. Do either, do you see any connection between these two bodies of work other than them being very opposing? Somehow they work in this gallery. What do you guys think? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we're always projecting so much. So I think the neither one of us are, are, are doing anything that's going to be content with a static geometry. There's something like a little restless about everything that we're doing, um, which could speak to lots of different things. Um, and I think it, it becomes more, more concrete because Kasumi's making some specific references, but, um, uh, but there's some, there, there's a little bit of a challenge to a norm. And in mine, it's maybe a little bit of uh, like a hallucinogenic challenge to the norm, right? Something normal is not happening uh, or something abnormal is happening, whichever. Um, and I think it's, uh, there's, there's something about like sharing the imagery in Kasumi's, but like challenging us to like question this, all this imagery. It's also fun. I mean, it's challenging, but I think I agree. Really, really it, it is. Both bodies of work are fun. Um, there's, you know, the restlessness. I like, I like that adjective because there is kind of a quality of, of movement to, well, I mean, there's some literal movement <laughs> and, 
and there's some um, there's just the, this there's there's nothing static about any of this work in either of these galleries. Um, there's something pushing, you know, um, out of each. So I just thought it was so fascinating to have the chance to have two artists who work in completely different mediums both come together during a global pandemic, make prints, and then come up with these fascinating bodies of work that are completely different and yet somehow strangely kind of locked together in a, in a, in a bizarre way. But that's just, like I said, that's as an observer. But um, we're, we're already, you know, I'm, I'm, I could talk all night to you, Mark. So I'm gonna yeah. move on to Kasumi. I'm gonna pick it up a little bit. Kasumi, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining yeah. us tonight. I'm just gonna read a little your, your bio here. Kasumi is an artist who works in a broad range of media, um, directing and producing short and feature length experimental films, live shows, you're a VJ, um, public art projections, creating looping electronic um, installations and sculptures. Um, you've designed motion graphics and animated GIFs, um, 360 degree virtual reality pieces. And um, so when thinking of all of that, this is a very different body of work. And yet it's a very similar body of work. And I had the great pleasure of writing about the exhibition and the work you made for the Can Journal um, that came out before the exhibition, but I'm just gonna read um, my personal observations. I said that the prints Kasumi made during her residency could be described as the two-dimensional manifestation of her film practices. Using found imagery, graffiti, stencils, and gestural marks, she builds up layer upon layer of color and texture. Familiar faces from pop culture, manga, and historical figures make appearances in various compositions, overlaid with text in several languages and a dizzying array of pattern and shape. Despite their obviously static physical shape, Kasumi achieves a surprising level of movement in these prints, a bit like Hannah Hawk on speed. <laughs> That's what I came up with. Colorful and frenetic, Kasumi's silk screen prints are full of life and as spirited as her films. And if you don't um, know Kasumi's films, um, you can go to her website. She has some, um, some clips available on YouTube to watch. And there is a film in this exhibition, which I'm so happy that it's here. So observers get a chance to compare the, the two mediums. So I'm gonna start off by asking, could you tell us uh, what it was like um, experimenting with, with printmaking at Zygo? Um, as have you ever done printmaking? It, I, I had not done it before. It was the greatest thing. First of all, to do it anyway. I love zygote and I just, it, there's the vibe is just fantastic. Um, and so in any event, it was fun. But on top of it, we're in this, this upside down world of political upheaval and social madness and the pandemic. I mean, it, the, the whole, the, um, the angst produced during this time. And I mean, this is a year already when I was doing them, we were already, you know, months into the pandemic. Um, and what it offered me was a physical outlet for my, expression. Um, I did, I was skeptical about doing any video work for this simply because technical, I, I just wanted to pull the plug, literally pull the plug. I did have the one piece, the one that is, um, if you go, go to this slide where the, um, the video is playing and then there's a print that is associated with that, that's literally, back, back, Nope, oh, there we go. The one before, go before. This one? One, but go before that one. Well, that's the video, right. Mm -hmm. And then I, one, often when I'm working on a film, I'll stop on frames and feel that that image kind of captures the entire essence of that one film. And I feel that this, this was a frame. And then I, I separated the channels and kind of, moved them a little bit just to get, you know, 
movement in the in the work, you know, you can see the layers aren't aligned and they are not aligned deliberately. But just having the um, the physical outlet. Plus, I I used all my junk wood in my garage and I made like twenty five frames, silk screen frames, and I. So I, I made a little auxiliary studio in the, in my garage. It's called the Annex now. <laughs> great, that's great. You know, so, so again, I, again, using your hands, right? Had to, yeah. Using, building something out of wood, having a physical object. Exactly. You know, the last thing you wanted to do was go get on a screen, right? Exactly. Well, I had just been doing a bunch of uh, film stuff and post-production stuff, and I just needed to step away in the... You know the weather was beautiful we were finally getting some you know finally coming out of winter right um so it was an awesome you know just an awesome experience and speaking about the pandemic um and kind of what was happening at that time politically as as mm -hmm. well as reflected in some of the work in the show this this amazing series that you can see behind me uh, of american patriot um obviously depicting John Lewis, um, these striking portraits of the late civil rights leader and congressman who, who passed away, um, and you know just shortly July after 17th, July seventeenth, right in the middle of, you know, of everything of the explosion, um, and you know this was this image you chose this image. Um, why, why did you choose this image? This because there's there's multiple mug shots. Yeah. <laughs> okay. well, it's good this, trouble. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you, in, in all of my work, what I'm really interested in is gesture. As Mark, you know, was talking about gesture. And for me, a, a gesture is a, a physical movement, a, a glance, an expression. And I felt that in this one, he's, the way he's looking at the camera is just so powerful. Um, the one that, eyes, the gaze is just slightly askew. One is looking right at the camera and one is looking kind of off in the distance as if saying, there is something better. Let's fight for what's better. Um, and that similarly in the, the piece associated with the, with the video that's in the gallery, um, that gesture was from a film, a really kind of an obscure and not really good film um, about the um, uh, gold mines in South Africa. And it was actually filmed during apartheid and they didn't address the, um, the hardships and uh, unfairness of the, the mines themselves and the damage it caused to the health of the workers. And there was one scene where a lot of the workers were being presented to some owner or something. And um, one man in a really young man in particular, he made this gesture, which is depicted in this in this piece, in you know, all aspects of this of the movement. And he just turns his head to the camera, just the one like microsecond and that was the gesture that I wanted to capture in that he's speaking he's speaking to us help us tell our story you know the film itself was awful but this particular little bit of the film was was okay. it's that moment that you capture it's, it's and the then moment. you use that and then you work with that gesture and expand exactly. on it in the film exactly version of it exactly. below, um, which is something that you do. And because I've had uh, the one- I was just gonna uh, mention the Maryland piece. Right, so-, so that, I, another, uh, that piece, it, there, I have a couple of other um, Maryland pieces. And what I did was I found, actually it was in the film, um, Some Like It Hot, where she's singing in the band, you know, there's a band behind her and she's looking around the room and she gets this really, vulnerable, serious expression on her face. And when he, she makes this one, just this one turn, that was the one where she reveals her vulnerability and her, this deeper essence, you know, not the, you know, the blonde bombshell exterior, but the inner quality. And this piece, 
um, while we're on it, was one of my first pieces um, where I, I had previously created some glitch, some glitch uh, work and I wanted to replicate the idea of glitching with a silkscreen print. So the way I did it was separate, again, separate channels and then glitch the separate channels and then shift them as I was printing. So, so you see that in the whole, not only in that one, but you have an entire manga. series of the glitch manga. And um, I, I just thought it was so interesting that you utilize what is in effect a digital media malfunction, right? Exactly. As, as an aesthetic, but, in, yes. but yes. if you've ever done screen printing, you realize mm -hmm. that it's that in a way it's almost you're also poking fun at the trials and tribulations of registration errors, <laughs> right? But you're exactly. you're purposefully purposely. I love doing it. Right. I mean, I didn't. I just start. I just am scratching. Talk about printmaking 101. I mean, <laughs> right. I made every mistake in the book, and they're all up on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> you would never know <laughs> because they look. Fantastic. And it was um, just so much fun. But oh you caught the itch, right? Didn't you? Because I, I think I remember you saying that you were setting up a, a, a screen printing setup in your annex or at home. It's here. I have at least 25, 26 screens that I made from junk wood. It was mm -hmm. in my garage. You know, I bought the silk and did it. And, you know, the only thing I don't have the exposure unit on my right. property. Right. Well, you can, I can, I can always come back and use ours. <laughs> so. but what a trip. What, what yeah, a these, great outlet. Are you a manga fan? Because it really, you capture the Love. spirit of it, you know. The 80s manga are my thing. I, I, I just love that. And these, these hyperbolic expressions and they're just wacky and crazy and explosive. Totally. And fun. And there, and I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, you know, I talked with Mark about the element of kind of play and fun and mm -hmm. tongue in cheek kind of attitude to some of his work with yours. It, like this title, I have to tell you when I read this, I cannot read this title without saying, are you ready for some artwork? Because, yes. <laughs> and then you've got the football player, you got the jock guy, you got the little kid the cheerleader and it and it's like the natural expression of your meta montage it had that, to happen that, so i was so happy to see that there were collage works in the show um knowing your film work which is digital collage yeah, it's collage right exactly. so, so was this i mean there's got to be the aspect of fun in these collage pieces is really oh, right it's the most fun collage it's the best outlet it's almost immediate gratification one um and it gives me not only the physical outlet of playing with stuff but you get to use scissors which is right. so great when when the tensions are high i all i actually started collages during the um last election mm, and okay. i just was, all i could do was i wanted to cut stuff mm -hmm. and that's when i started actually doing collages like and I, these, I but these incorporate your silk screen too. So I did. I, I did. You know, I had some silk screens that weren't quite finished, but they had like great splashes of color and shape. And I thought, I'm gonna just cut these up. So these <laughs> collages are the, the last last things I did. The okay. very first thing you showed that um, Maxi y Dario, um, those are second to the last in the you know, grand scheme of things. Um, those were the samples I used for those um, were graffiti that I shot in Paris, like okay. 2011 when I was there. And um, this one in particular, Maxi Dario, they were um, uh, social activists in uh, Argentina. They were assassinated one, uh, I think, 21 and 25 years old. They were assassinated by the police in Buenos Aires um, for their work, you know? And so the fight, and so the, the thread of, of political awareness and upheaval and social change is also kind of in, in this 
collection in, in a way. Oh, you definitely. You know, when I look back yeah. at the time I was just doing, you know, and I didn't really think about it, but how these people affected me and affect us. Definitely, certainly. And I time. wanted to give the, um, everyone here a chance to see the film that um, goes with Take Me to Cloudy Rhythm um, and about that moment that you tried to capture. It's funny because watching this, you you don't know who these people are. You know, you're not giving us any information. All you feel is um, emotional connection, um, and then you feel this rhythm. And um, there's no sound, so there's no sound in the gallery. There's no sound anywhere, and obviously that's intentional. And um, but there's certainly a visual rhythm that you have created by the movement of the imagery and with rhythm literally in the title, you know, <laughs> that, that helps, helps move us along. But is there a connection to sound? Like, are you, are you thinking- Not in this it? particular piece, not okay. in this piece. Not in yeah. this one, but I've seen your work in the past, I think where- oh, Sound is huge. Sound plays a huge role That's in your work. But I think it's fascinating that even though you, you eliminated the sound, you're creating a rhythm, a visual rhythm um, without sound. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a really, really moving, beautiful piece. And I'm so happy that you included it in the show again, so that when viewers come, they can take a moment to see the kind of digital manipulations that you do. And if you're unaware of, of the kind of work she does, I, I mean, the, what, your, your feature film um, was Chocolate. composed of, yeah what, 24,000 digital frames um, that you can stitch together. Um, so seeing you work with your hands, <laughs> doing the same thing physically with paper mm -hmm. and with screens is just such a treat visually to witness. And, and I think you've caught the bug, right? So you're going to continue with the and there's no vaccine there's no vaccine for this one no no you're in trouble <laughs> i'm just yeah. so glad that you that both of you were able to work here like mark was saying you know so many of zygotes plans you know i came to zygote in march as the new programming person and that was a huge bummer because everything that we had planned was immediately canned okay. And you know, having to kind of just all, all of us collectively struggling, trying to find our way, navigating through this weird world, but yet we were still able to host both of you and that, and that just makes me so happy. And, and that you both had such rich experiences here. That's just always our goal with residencies. And even in this bizarre environment where collaboration was incredibly different, you know, difficult. It was difficult. Yeah. It's not that it didn't happen. I know that you worked with our shop manager. I know that you, you know, had instruction, but as you can imagine, now that things are relaxing, we're getting that collaborative environment back. So I really wanted to personally invite you both to come back um, when you're, you know, feeling comfortable again <laughs> and, and experience, you know, an open studio when we have eight people working in the shop all at once. And it's just, I'm so thrilled that the exhibition was able to happen too, because originally yeah, yeah. the exhibition was supposed to be last year as well. Um, but it all, somehow it all worked out. <laughs> Sometimes that's how these things happen. Um, so it's 6.45, I'm gonna just quickly shift to showing a few, so in addition to having the physical manifestation of the exhibition here in the gallery, we also have a uh, virtual exhibition um, that I'm gonna just show you very quickly. Um, I'm gonna, and I can actually also drop the link in the chat um, for this maybe. Um, it's, it's a wonderful website that was put together by our gallery director, Yana. And when you go through, you go to the various different um, artists, both of them, all of the works that are in the show are on the website. If one of them strikes your fancy, say this one, for example, you can click on it and it's supposed to go to the art store. 
but maybe it doesn't. So um, I'm going to also show you where all of the most of the work in the show is available for sale. Obviously, some of Mark's um, um, augmented reality is not for sale, but you can come and experience it with us. <laughs> but we do have an actual art store. Um, I'm going to show you all of Mark's monotypes are for sale on the art store. And of course, Zygote's Wi-Fi is going to trudge along here. I'm going to drop this in the chat as well. Um, so as you can see, there's a, a Mark Schatz 2021 and Kasumi 2021. And as you can see, there's still work available here. Here's Glitch Bombshell. Um, at most of all, of all of Kasumi's work is available except for the things that have sold already. Um, so uh, you can get to this from the virtual exhibition. You can come in person as well. Um, someone will be here tomorrow um, to, to, if you want to take one of these amazing works of art home with you, um, you're more than welcome to do so. I'm gonna actually end the screen sharing right now um, and make sure that I've answered everyone's question. We are reopening um, tomorrow for Open Studio for the first time in a year and a half. So it's the first time we'll be able to have artists that aren't, you know, art shop artists come into the studio and have that collaborative experience again in the and be working. And um, so we're just, as Jackie said in the chat, we're super thrilled to be able to open back up to the public again. And, um, you know, as things hopefully get better, we'll be able to have more and more. We're going to be having our very first in-person class in August. Um, it'll be silk screening with Anna Tararova. It's a joint workshop with the Morgan. So you'll make paper with Anna at the Morgan and then with intent to bring the paper here to screen on. Um, so we're, that will be our first in-person class. And this is our first in-person exhibition. So. We're just all thrilled that we, thanks to the generosity of everyone in the Zygo community, that we were able to stay afloat, <laughs> you know, and to still exist um, after all of this. But I did want to open it up to a Q&A here for the last portion of the evening. So if you have a question, there are a couple of ways you can do it. You can drop it in the chat. You can raise your hand by going to the reactions button at the bottom of your screen and it, there's a raise hand prompt, um, or you can just unmute yourself and shout, <laughs> whatever, whatever works for you. Does anyone have any questions or I can bring up the PowerPoint again too, if that's helpful for anyone or to Mark and Kasumi, do you have any questions for each other? <laughs> no, I, I don't have a question. I just thought it was, as Kasumi was talking about her work um, and, and taking moments out of pieces of film, one of the ways I've sort of been processing or, or uh, beginning to understand what role the prints played in these larger things, because I felt like I was committing some like printmaking sacrilege because in a lot of ways, the print wasn't the ultimate product for me. Like the print was this thing in the process of going to this other thing um, and they have completely different qualities, and I like that about it, but it, it felt like, um, uh, like sort of what I like about the prints after having experienced the 3D models is that they're like having a, um, a preparatory sketch or like the, the, the assets of this larger project or like a, like a film still or like the, the way um, single animation cells are, are collected, and it, it makes sense or it has its value or its value is different in the context of, of what else it was, but on its own, it's not the whole thing. So um, uh, that just resonated with me too, is that I'm, I'm sort of reversing that too, but um, yeah. but yeah, that was really interesting to go back and forth between, between something as a piece of something else. I think it's important to have both of these aspects. That's a nice cup, by the way. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> Um, to have both aspects, to have a multiple way of perceiving a yeah. piece, you know? Yeah, it was really interesting. And so uh, your pieces, I think it would be, I think it's more meaningful to have the prints and the three-dimensional 
objects in space yeah. rather than one or the other. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was I, I think that was really important and meaningful to have. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. I agree that it's like um, it's part of the story. You have a story that you're telling and there's all the, it, it would be like missing the middle <laughs> if if right. or just you would be it's a fragment right like a fragment of a larger narrative that's going on and in the same way that if you took one of kasumi's layers off one of her screen prints you would lose a fragment of a story and um even though they're completely different um there's so much intent with the varying layers and with the varying layers of media that you were able to pursue. Uh, Mark, you know, I think I told you that when I saw your work at Rooms to Let many years ago, um, I think that, well, was that 2014? Oh, I want to think about it. Okay, it was a while ago, <laughs> but Mark had the most amazing installation um, in the attic of one of the houses in Rooms to Let. And it was made up of how many? I mean, thousands. Of yeah. little mirrors. Didn't count. It seemed like a million little mirrors all lined up, um, and it was so moving. And um, and when I think about that work now, and I think about your work here, I, I see a thread. I see a thread through it, I, and it's it's very much about installation. But but the thing that strikes me the most is the way you want the viewer to engage yeah. with your work. And not everyone does that, you know, like um, Kasumi is very democratic and inviting with her work in one way. I can see how your work might be slightly intimidating to some people because it's, you know, it's a little bit on the analytical side, but it's totally not. And, and you're inviting the viewer into this experience, just like you were inviting the viewer into that attic. Um, you can't go through this room it, without doing the augmented reality. You're getting like half of the story. Yeah. right you're not getting the full story so i really like that there's work to do for me you know as a viewer i like i really and i know that that's probably intentional um is it <laughs> yeah i mean I, I, it's interesting i like the way you're you're describing it as like the work of the viewer right like because you have to be a willing participant and I, that's that's my um, that's not my only driver, but that's my primary driver. It's like, what is this exchange? How do I reach across to somebody? How do I create an experience that, um, yeah, to some degree, it, it feels theatrical in that way. It's that we're, we're here in this place, and this place is not any other place. It's this place. How do I make that uh, stand out? Right. Make that experience? I mean, you're even choreographing it in a way, you know, because you move through, you're actually choreographing the way the viewer moves through the space, which um, I find really interesting. Um, there's some artists that really, they don't give you much, right? They don't invite that kind of dialogue yeah. with the work. Um, some of it's very standoffish and in, intent. Um, so I appreciate Does Does anyone else have any questions? I could, again, I talk way too much. So if someone else wants to jump in with a question that would be great anyone you just keep bringing up all the good stuff so oh, everything i thought of i'm like <laughs> well all right britney's got this so all right mark's oh. like you saying some great stuff and of course kasumi always says some great stuff but the thing that i'm kind of curious about is like you know as as you sort of got into the tactility of the material of print and the paper and all that kind of stuff did that start to reverberate and kind of like make the artist in both their ways think about sort of um, uh, changing their current path or thinking about a path differently or what's going to happen in the future because of this, I guess. Totally. You know, actually, because it's out, out of COVID, everything changes, right? Everything changed. After, the, after I did this, um, so I really, one of the last things I did, um, in addition, I was sort of doing them simultaneously, the collages and the um, glitched manga. I got really into that manga image, just blowing it up further and further and kind of abstracting it a little bit. Um, and I actually, I did some paintings. It's like, what, where did that, I mean, they're huge. They're, I have four um, 48 by 48 inch 
paintings and then um, based on, there's another print that you did not show, which was the red, white, and kablooey, which oh, is right. the most political piece in the, in the bunch. And that, that's before January 6th happened. I mean, right. that was like, we're talking about the circular firing squad of a certain party in our country. Um, and after that happened, I did um, three, uh, they're 48 by 72 inch paintings, I mean, big, big. And I hadn't done painting since art school. So this is, this is what working with ink and paper kind of brought about for me is the, um, the courage to go in a one, here's this one image, as opposed to moving images, a series of moving images, which film is. Interesting. That's really yeah, I, I, I feel like it's a can of worms, like it's oh, a, this kind of exponential worms. thing that every, that, that was actually what was difficult about the material processes is you, you could see so many paths. I was like, well, I'm not gonna have time to, solve all those problems, right? So it's like, yeah, you put a pin in all of these things in, in, um, in some ways I'm talking about like the, the model being visualization because I would love to work big and there's all these tools for working big, but it requires lots of access and complicated storage that was hard when we're all trying to stay away from each other. So, uh, uh, and just being able to integrate other materials and some of those things looked like they were printed on inflated vinyl and or mylar, and I was like, now I want to print on inflatable vinyl and mylar and see what uh, what that looks like when when these things then go like full cycle and turn into objects. Um, but I was also struck. One of the challenges is I'm not image driven. I like images, but I'm not image driven. Right? It's it is the physicality and it helps to walk into a printmaking studio with some images because you have so many ways of transforming and translating imagery. Mm -hmm. But the process of making these things, uh, of working with gesture, of, of taking these shapes and turning them into physical things, generated imagery. So now I have this whole vocabulary of imagery that is, that is beginning to be generated out of this that I would love to see what happens as you translate these into screen prints, translate these into these other processes that I was like, hmm, what's happening over there? What's happening over there? But there's just not time to do it all. So yeah, uh, yeah I felt like a, a little bit of a candy store. It was pretty fun. It is pretty intoxicating, even for people like me, I'm a writer, but there's just something about printmaking that is so intoxicating. And, um, you know, from letterpress to screen print, all, I want to do all of it. And, uh, and just getting a chance to be here is so wonderful. But Mark, you mentioned the possibility of like physical manifestation of those balloons and printing on them. And yeah. that to me is so exciting because that's like, a, that's where my brain went with those creatures. I was like, I wanna meet these creatures now this is in the physical realm, you know, yeah. like I want to see what they would look like, but who knows what that would work out. <laughs> like printing on Mylar, you know, who knows? Um, that'll be for your next residency, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah somebody's doing it. Somebody's doing it. Cool. If, does anyone else have Very any correct. questions for these two fabulous artists who are here with us tonight? Thank you, Bruce. Laughing. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate you. <laughs> we appreciate you, Bruce. Anyone else? Um, well, if not, I mean, we can wrap it up a little bit early. If you perchance get a chance to come into Zygo and experience the exhibition in the next week while it's still up and you then are suddenly struck with questions, which is usually what happens to me, you feel free to email me, Brittany at zygopress.org. And then I can relay the question to the artists and get you an answer to your question. And I misspelled my email because it's Friday. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, Zygo, you know. Um, but anyway, the, the two of you have been so open and so kind to share your thoughts about your work with us and just being a part of being our first, like I said, our first um, exhibition back, back in the gallery. It has been um, very overwhelming with 
positive emotions. And I'm yeah. just so thrilled to have been able to talk to both of you. You're two of my favorite artists working in the area. So I'm very, very happy I got a chance. I, I like had you all to myself and all these other people too. Um, <laughs> The community there was so great too. And for a public exhibition, I wasn't sure what we were going to get. We've got a, a printmaking community, and I'm giving them invisible sculpture. So I wasn't sure what kind of reception that was going to get. And uh, and the the community was so open to the conversations and for trying and and like you said, doing the work to uh, to experience the art and make connections back and forth. Yeah, definitely so. i mean you felt it you know yeah, like it was yeah. you had at the opening we we all got a chance to have that feeling again yeah that yeah. feeling that that art brings up brings us together and when you're in a group with a good community like that it just yeah it hits me it right it in the heart so i'm so pleased to have had the chance to work with you both tonight on this artist talk like i said the show is up we are open tomorrow from 12 to 4 if you have a chance to just pop in, you can come by anytime. You don't need an appointment. If you do want to come by during the week, it will we'll accommodate you. You can send us an email at gallery at zygopress.org. Um, if you take a look at our virtual exhibition, there's information on making an appointment there too. And also check out Zygote's YouTube page. There's a full walkthrough. So if you can't make it here in the next week, there's Yana created this beautiful walkthrough of the entire exhibition and there's additional videos that Mark created so be sure and check that out and thank you thank you thank you everyone for being here tonight we appreciate you thank and you. be well everyone be well thank you, yeah thanks everyone for bye everyone thank you